To this point in our course, we've considered the letter of 1st Clement and its implications for understanding the development of the Church's official hierarchy. In this lecture and the two that follow, we turn to consider one of the most intriguing figures among the Apostolic Fathers, Ignatius of Antioch. Ignatius was the Bishop of Antioch in the early 2nd century. Antioch of Syria had one of the largest and most important churches in the first two centuries. In the uh, New Testament times, it appears that Antioch was the largest church after the church in Jerusalem and probably outgrew the Jerusalem church uh, very early on. It appears to have been comprised of uh, Christians, who, some of whom were from Jewish, uh, Jewish stock and others who were from, uh, from the Gentiles, so that it was a mixed Jewish-Gentile church from the earliest of times and was a very large church that was influential, for example, on the Apostle Paul in the early years of, of his life as a, as a Christian. Its sheer size, uh, the sheer size of the church in Antioch, may have been what led to the conflicts between Christians and pagans in the city. There appear to have been some persecutions of Christians, especially the one we know about, uh, very little about, we know something about, with respect to Ignatius himself. We don't actually have the details to anything like the extent we'd like, uh, but it does appear that there was a city-wide persecution of Christians in Antioch sometime around the year A.D. 110, while Ignatius was the bishop. He and other members of the congregation were arrested and sent to Rome to face execution. Now, we don't know uh, why they didn't round up the entire church. Uh, we don't know why they chose just some members of the church. It may be that they rounded up the leaders of the church, or it may be that uh, only some of the members of the church were recognized as, uh, as being Christian. Uh, we'll see in a later lecture, uh, we're, we're going to devote an entire lecture to this question of how and why Christians came to be persecuted and how it is that some of them came to be martyred. Uh, one thing to emphasize already at this early point in the course is that Christianity was not, technically speaking, an illegal religion, which makes it uh, quite interesting to figure out why they were being persecuted if they were not illegal. I'll say a few words about that at the end of this lecture, but at this point I'll simply point out that the um, that the that Christianity was not declared illegal by by the Roman Senate or by the Roman Emperor, so that Christians are being arrested on some other grounds uh, during their persecutions. We'll also consider at the end of this lecture why it is if if Ignatius is condemned to death, why he wasn't executed on the spot which is normally what happened in, uh, in the early Christian martyrdoms, is that when a person was arrested in a place on the grounds of being a Christian, they, they were killed then and there. The reason we know about Ignatius is that he wrote several letters en route to his martyrdom in Rome. He evidently was taken under armed guard on a land route from Antioch of Syria through Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, so he's heading west toward, uh, toward Rome. On the way, uh, he and his guards made a stop in the city of Smyrna, where representatives of some other churches from the area came to meet him and lend their support. Ignatius then wrote several letters to these churches, uh, the letters that we know about are letters that he wrote to the church in Ephesus, city of Ephesus, the church of Magnesia, and the church of Tralles. Also at this time, he wrote a letter to the Christians who were awaiting his arrival in the city of Rome. So they knew he was coming, and he, he writes a letter to them. That's the letter we'll spend the most time on in this particular lecture. From, from Smyrna, uh, Ignatius journeyed on to the city of Troas, and there he dashed off three more letters, uh, one uh, to the church in Philadelphia, uh, not, not our Philadelphia, but uh, the Philadelphia in uh, Asia Minor, one back to the city of Smyrna, whence he had come, and one a personal letter that he wrote to the bishop of Smyrna, uh, Polycarp, whom I mentioned earlier. These seven letters that Ignatius wrote still survive. They make for fascinating reading. 
for they were written by a man who knew that he was soon to be thrown to the wild beasts as punishment for his Christian belief. They're written in some haste. They're written with some urgency. Uh, and you can, you can tell this when you read the letters in the Greek. Uh, you, you, it's hard to see this when you're reading them in English translation because translators tend to smooth over things. Uh, but in fact, there are, uh, you can tell that he's writing in haste because he'll sometimes start a thought and not finish it. So there are actual gram- grammatical mistakes in these letters where he'll begin a sentence and then think of something else and start talking about the something else and never finish a sentence. So clearly he's writing, writing in, uh, with some urgency. I, I've just recently published a translation of the Apostolic Fathers, including the writings of Ignatius, and I had a difficult decision to make when translating Ignatius's letters because on the one hand, you want to show something of the urgency that he's, he's writing under and, uh, which means, which means that you want to show the grammatical mistakes so the English reader can sense it. But on the other hand, when you do that, it looks like you, you don't know how to write English. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so somebody reads and says, this is a terrible translation. This sentence doesn't have an ending. <laughs> and so you have to decide what to do. And I, uh, I, I decided to leave there. You call, you call that grammatical, uh, phenomenon of somebody starting a thought and not finishing it. Grammatically, that's called an anacoluthon, uh, which means it doesn't follow. Uh, and so I decided to leave the anacolutha in the, uh, in the text. And so I just, in my introduction to the text, I explained, uh, yes, I do know how to write English, but this is how Ignatius writes Greek. And so that's, that's what we're, that's what we're stuck with. Well, these are fascinating, uh, fascinating letters. The letters on the whole are written both to thank the churches that have lended him some support and to address important issues that are facing the churches that he's, uh, that he's writing. As such, these letters give us insight into the concerns and problems that were facing Christians in the early second century. So these are a very useful source of information about early second century Christianity. Broadly speaking, there are three major concerns that dominate these letters of Ignatius. First, Ignatius was concerned that there be unity in the churches. He was concerned that the churches be unified. This theme can be found uh, throughout his letters. It's it's in uh, just about all of the letters. Uh, And I'll just give you one example of uh, of a, a passage in which he shows that he's concerned about church unity. This is from his letter to the Philadelphians. Uh, this is from chapter 7 and 8, where he's, he's reminding his readers that, as you know, he says, I cried out while I was among you, speaking in a great voice, the voice of God, pay attention to the bishop and the presbytery and the deacons. That's, that's what he told them. But some suspected that I said these things because I knew in advance that there was a division among you. But the one in whom I am bound is my witness that I knew it from no human source. But the Spirit was speaking, saying, Do nothing apart from the bishop. Keep your flesh as the temple of God. Love, unity, flee divisions. And so he's, he's saying here that, uh, that he, was sort of in, he was inspired by the Spirit to urge them to seek out unity. Uh, and the way to seek unity, uh, uh, according to this, is by following the leadership of the church. This theme of unity is found in another way. It's not just that he addresses the churches that he's concerned that they're disunified. He also refers to problems in his own home church, the church that was in Antioch of Syria, which he indicates in the letter to the Philadelphians that uh, he indicates that this church was not at peace. Now, some people, some scholars have thought when, that when Ignatius says that the Church of Antioch was not at peace, that it was continuing to suffer persecution. And that, that may be what, what Ignatius is referring to. But other scholars have thought that, in fact, what he's referring to are internal dissensions within the church. That like the church in Philadelphia and the church in Tralles and the church in Smyrna, the church in Antioch had been experiencing problems of division within the church. We know from other sources that Antioch, uh, since it was such a large church, had a number of different groups represented within it, a number of different Christian perspectives found in the church of Antioch. Probably the situation is 
that with such a large city, with a large Christian church, the church doesn't all meet in one place. This is in a period before there were such things as church buildings. Christians met in private homes, and so the wealthier members of the churches would host the community of believers in their homes once a week or, or more often, and that means in a large city like Antioch, there'd be a number of churches spread throughout the city, and th there might be one person who's ahead of all of these different house churches who might be the bishop, but some of these house churches might not get along with other house churches, and they might have different perspectives. Just like in any town in America today, you can have different churches with wildly different understandings of, of, their, of the faith. Well, the same thing was probably true in Antioch. We know of churches, we know at least of Christians in Antioch who uh, were not among the proto-Orthodox. We know, for example, of Christians in Antioch from as early as we have records, from the New Testament times itself, from the writings of the Apostle Paul, that there were Christians in Antioch whom uh, you might call Judaizers. Uh, a Judaizer is, is a Christian who thinks that other Christians have to keep the Jewish law. Most uh, Christians, of course, uh, even in the ancient world, did not think that, that Christians, as Christians, had to keep kosher food laws or had to observe the Sabbath day, or had to observe Jewish festivals. But there were Christians who said that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah who was sent from the Jewish God to the Jewish people in fulfillment of the Jewish law, so this religion is Jewish. Which meant, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, you have to be a Jew. Uh, there were people like that in Antioch, and there were other people who said, no, Jesus fulfilled the law, so we don't have to keep the law any longer. That was a point of dissension. There are other Christian groups that we know, we know about in, in Antioch, and it may be that when Ignatius refers to the church being not at peace, that uh, he may be referring to internal turmoil that's happening there between the Judaizers and the Proto-Orthodox and various other church groups within the community. It's also possible that part of the problem in Antioch had to do with the leadership of the church over the question of who would be the bishop. It's possible, in the opinion of some scholars, that Ignatius himself had been part of the problem, that Ignatius had been a controversial leader in the church of Antioch, and that when he left, there were, there were disputes about who would replace him. Which bishop, representing which view of Christianity, would become, would become the leader uh, of the church? Uh, and so, in any event, it's clear that unity is a problem for Ignatius, and, uh, and not just in the churches that he's addressing, but also in his home church. So that's the first major theme that you find in Ignatius' letters, uh, the, the need for unity. Second related theme is that Ignatius thinks very strongly that the Christians need... To, uh, of these various churches need to make sure that they follow the teaching of the bishop. Each church has a bishop, and according to Ignatius, and the churches should follow the teachings of the bishop. Uh, I'll give you an example of this uh, uh, from uh, from Magnesians three one, the letter to the uh, Christians in Magnesia. Uh, it's where uh, they apparently had a young bishop. Uh, and some people didn't respect him because he was a young man. But Ignatius says, it's not right for you to take advantage of your bishop because of his age. You should render him all due respect because, according to the power of God, just as I've learned that your holy presbyters do. And uh, not only pay uh, respect to him, but to the Father of Jesus Christ, the bishop of all. As we saw in a previous lecture, at one point Ignatius says that you should follow the bishop as you follow God the Father. He says in one passage in his letter to the Smyrnians something uh, quite quite interesting, um, where he uh, is talking about following the bishop, and he says uh, he says this: All of you should follow the bishop as Jesus Christ follows the Father, follow the presbytery as you would follow the apostles. He goes on to say, Let the congregation be wherever the bishop is. In other words, without a bishop, you don't really have a church. You can't gather together without the bishop. Just as wherever Jesus Christ is, there also is the universal church. Without Christ, no church. It's not permitted either to baptize or to hold a love feast without the bishop. 
In other words, you can't have the sacraments of baptism and the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, unless the bishop is there. I should say, uh, when I was a graduate student, for the first time reading this letter to the Smyrnians, I was taken aback by, when I was reading this in Greek, because in the Greek, uh, literally th this says that unless the bishop is present, you should neither baptize nor make love. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that, that is a very strange church there in Smyrna. <laughs> but, uh, but what he means is, uh, do not, do not perform the love feast. In other words, don't have the uh, sacred Eucharist, uh, unless the, unless the bishop is present. At least I think that's what he means. Uh, it's important uh, to note that uh, this idea that there's only one bishop over the church is quite different from what we find in the letters of Paul, or even in First Clement, where there's a there's a group of bishop, a group of presbyters, but not one bishop. Um, finally, Ignatius, th the third major point in Ignatius's letters is that Ignatius was uh, particularly concerned about the disunifying features of false teachers in the midst of these congregations. He was especially concerned that the congregations were being led astray by those who were heterodox. Uh, and we will, in fact, devote the next two lectures to this question of false teachings according to Ignatius and the problem of heresy in the early second century Christian church. But I want in the rest of this lecture to turn to one, uh, the, the one, uh, most, the, the most unusual letter in the letters of Ignatius, which is his letter to the Romans. The other letters were all written to churches that he had had some contact with en route to Rome. But the letter to the Romans is to the church that he's going to visit once he arrives in Rome for his, for his martyrdom. And so this letter is not written to a church that has sent representatives in support, in support of him. What's intriguing about the letter to the Romans is that Ignatius writes this letter not in order for it to help him out when he arrives. He does not want them to uh, help him out so that he can escape his cruel death by being thrown to the wild beast. You would think that would be why he would write, say, look, you know, you got to intervene for me here. In fact, quite the contrary. Ignatius explicitly indicates that he wants them not to intervene in the proceedings. The point of the letter is to convince the Romans to allow him to die as a martyr because he wants to suffer a violent death. He wants to suffer a violent death because Jesus, his Lord, suffered a violent death. And if he is to be a true disciple of Jesus, he similarly will die a violent death. And so uh, this letter is designed to convince the Romans not to intervene in the proceedings. At one point, it gets rather interesting because he says um, that uh, when I when I come among you, when I when I show up there, uh, if I say something different, don't pay attention to me. <laughs> Listen to what I'm telling you now, <laughs> and then don't don't heed me if I say something later. So I mean, Ignatius was very human, even though he had this uh, this desire to suffer martyrdom. He uh, he realized that uh, he might change his mind uh, down the road. Well, I want to uh, read several passages from this letter uh, from this letter uh, to the Romans because it's uh, very interesting and uh, important for understanding Ignatius himself. First, this business that he does not want the uh, church in Rome to intervene on his behalf. Uh, I, I guess I should, uh, should say that the, these are, let me stress, these are actual letters. And so they begin the way letters in the ancient world begin, by the author introducing himself and addressing the, the people to whom he's writing. And so uh, this letter to the Romans begins, the very beginning is, Ignatius, who is also called God-bearer, uh, Theophorus is a nickname that Ignatius had, Theophorus, which means God-bearer. Uh, not quite sure why he had that name, whether he gave himself that name or if that's what other people called him. To the church that has obtained mercy by the greatness of the Father Most High and Jesus Christ, his only Son, the church that is loved and enlightened by the will of the one who has willed everything that is, uh, it goes on to say, the church uh, that is presiding in the land of the Romans. And then he goes on and, and greets, greets these Christians in Rome. And he uh, continues then on in, uh, chapter, in, in what we now call chapter 1. He, of course, didn't divide his 
letter into chapters. He just wrote a letter, but we, we've divided it into chapter and verses for ease of reference. He goes on to say that he is, uh, he is going to manage soon to see their faces, uh, and he is, uh, he will see their faces if it be the will of the one who has made me worthy to endure until the end. For the beginning is auspicious, he says. In other words, the beginning of my march toward death is auspicious if I can indeed obtain the gracious gift I need to receive my lot without any impediment. He doesn't want anything interfering with his fate. For I am afraid of your love that it may do me harm. This is an irony. They would hurt him if they didn't allow him to face the wild beast. For it's easy for you to do what you want, but it's difficult for me to attain to God if you do not spare me. So he wants to attain to God. This is a phrase he uses throughout his writings. Uh, he will achieve uh, a place before God. He will attain to God if they don't interfere. Uh, as he says in chapter 2, verse 2, grant me nothing more than to be poured out as a libation to God. So he wants to be a bloody sacrifice poured out to God, and he's asking them to grant him that. And he says in chapter 4, I'm writing to all the churches and giving instruction to all that I am willingly dying for God unless you hinder me. I urge you, do not become an untimely kindness to me. So don't do what you think is kind for me. That would be untimely. Uh, it's not the right time to show me kindness. I, I want you just to let me alone and let me die. Allow me to be bread for the wild beasts. Through them I am able to attain to God. I am the wheat of God and am ground by the teeth of the wild beasts that I might be found to be the pure bread of Christ. And so he has this image that he's like he's like the wheat that's going to be ground uh, up uh, by the beast, and then he'll be the pure bread of God. Ignatius wants very much to die for God, um, as we see as he continues here in chapter four, where he urges the Romans instead of preventing it, he says, coax the wild beasts that they may become a tomb for me and leave no part of my body behind that I may be a burden to no one once I have died. Then I will truly be a disciple of Christ when the world does not see even my body. Petition God on my behalf that I may be found a sacrifice through these instruments of God. So he'll be a sacrifice to God if, uh, if he dies by the wild beasts. He continues on uh, in using... Uh, words and phrases that uh, have struck many uh, subsequent readers as, uh, an almost, as almost pathological in his desire for death. Uh, let me read you the most graphic passage from chapter 5, where he says, May I have the full pleasure of the wild beasts prepared for me. I pray that they will be found ready for me. Indeed, I will coax them to devour me quickly, not as happens with some whom they are afraid to touch, so he must know about some cases where people have been thrown to the wild beasts and the beasts aren't hungry or something. But he, he wants this thing to happen. Um, Even if they do not wish to do so willingly, I will force them to it. Grant this to me. I know what benefits me. Now I am beginning to be a disciple. May, I, may nothing visible or invisible show any envy toward me that I may attain to Jesus Christ. And now the most graphic portion fire and cross, and packs of wild beasts, cuttings and being torn apart, the scattering of bones, the mangling of limbs, the grinding of the whole body, the evil torments of the devil, let them come upon me, only that I may attain to Jesus Christ. He very much wants to suffer death. And the reason he wants to suffer death, uh, he, uh, he makes quite clear in these passages, is so that he can be an imitator of Christ who also suffered a violent death. As he says later, Allow me to be an imitation of the suffering of my God. If anyone has him within himself, let him both understand what I want and sympathize with me, realizing the things that constrain me. 
Well, uh, this is interesting for a number of reasons. For one, for one thing, he co- <laughs> he speaks of the suffering of my God. This is interesting because, um, well, he, he's obviously saying Jesus Christ as God. That may not strike modern Christians as, as very odd because Christians have traditionally, uh, in the modern world, understood Jesus to be both human and divine, both man and God. But when you read the New Testament, it's very hard to find any explicit reference to Jesus being God. There are are some passages that are taken that way, and some that can certainly interpreted that way, but an explicit identification of Jesus as God is very hard to find. You you find expressions that Jesus is equal with God, but not that he's identical with God. See the difference? I mean, he might be equal with God, but, but here Jesus, in fact, is God. And Ignatius wants to imitate Jesus' suffering, uh, and so uh, and so his wish that the Romans not intervene. This death wish, uh, it may seem pathological to people today, but I should stress that it, that it seemed completely natural and right for Ignatius, because he saw this world as an evil place to be escaped. This is not a good place to be. We might be happy if we're comfortable middle-class uh, Americans who uh, don't, you know, don't really uh, have uh, wrenching agony uh, overtaking our lives. Uh, those of us in that situation might think the world's not such a bad place. For Ignatius, the world was a bad place. It was an evil place. It was a place to be escaped because it's the world controlled by the devil. If you want to get to God, you have to die. You have to leave this world. And so, uh, it was completely natural for him to want to escape. And he saw Christ as the way to God, and he wanted to imitate Christ as the Son of God, who was to be emulated in all things. Ignatius then, on his route to martyrdom, shows us what it was like to be an early Christian martyr. As we'll see in a later lecture, we have a number of martyrologies, a number of accounts of the deaths of the Christian martyrs. And one of the common themes in these martyrologies is the imitatio Christi, the imitation of Christ, where martyrs typically understood that by dying a violent death, they were in fact following in the footprints of Jesus himself. It's not clear to me one thing, which is, why Ignatius doesn't think everybody should suffer a violent death. I mean, if if he needs to suffer a violent death to attain to God, why doesn't he urge everybody to suffer a violent death? I don't know what the answer to that is, because, in fact, he doesn't. But for himself, at least, he, he wants to die the violent death by being thrown to the wild beasts. There are several intriguing questions about Ignatius' condemnation to face the wild beasts in Rome. For one thing, it's it's actually not all that clear why he was arrested. As I said earlier, Christianity was not, technically speaking, illegal in the Roman Empire. We'll be seeing later, uh, in a later lecture, why Romans persecuted the Christians if Christianity was not, in fact, illegal. The idea that it was illegal and Christians had to hide out in the catacombs of Rome to escape detection, and they recognized each other by drawing secret symbols like the fish, all of that is fiction. I mean, that, it, it might make for a, a good Hollywood script, but it, or, or a bad one, but it, it certainly is not historical, uh, as we'll see in a later lecture. Uh, so we, we'll need to think about why it is Ignatius and others were arrested. Another interesting point, historically, is it's not clear why he was sent to Rome to be executed instead of being executed on the spot. Some people have thought that Ignatius might be like Paul in the book of Acts in the New Testament. Paul also is sent to Rome to face execution. But in Paul's case, Paul is found guilty by a local court, and he appeals to the Caesar for his case to be heard. And so he's taken to Rome because he's a Roman citizen and has the right to appeal to Caesar. But that's not what's going on with Ignatius, because Ignatius isn't going under appeal. Ignatius is going because he wants to die. Uh, And he's not just, uh, it's not that his case is coming up, he's already been condemned. What some scholars think is that Ignatius is being sent to Rome by a local governor in Syria as a gift for the violent hunting games in the arena. 
Uh, they had, uh, you know, gladiatorial fights, but they also sent criminals in to fight the wild beasts as part of their entertainment. Where do they get the criminals from? Well, they got them often from the provinces. And so Ignatius might be uh, sent as a gift by the local governor to the emperor uh, for the violent hunting games in the arena. What's clear is that Ignatius' surviving letters, written under an obvious amount of stress, remain for us a, a stark testimony to the desire for some Christians to experience martyrdom in the early church. They also are a clear signal of the concerns of some Christians to promote church unity, to promote adherence to the one bishop, and to promote avoidance of all heretical teaching, as we'll see in the next two lectures.